Welcome to the FRC headquarters here in Washington, D.C. I'm Tony Perkins, president of the Family Research Council. Well, it's that time of year. The big yellow buses are rolling as kids head back to school. But it may be more than just your children taking their places in the classroom. So could the federal government through Common Core. For the next hour, we're going to take a deeper look at the topic in this special program entitled Common Core, the government's classroom. We'll find out from the experts what they are saying about the standards and where these standards may lead. Neil McCluskey from the Cato Institute joins us to talk about the intersection of federalism and Common Core. Dr. Sandy Stotsky of the University of Arkansas, a member of the Common Core Validation Committee, will talk with us about the academic standards of Common Core. Also, the growing opposition to Common Core among parents is making the issue a significant political issue. Louisiana Governor Bobby Jindal will talk to us about his reversal on Common Core. And Congressman Tom Cotton of Arkansas will discuss the president's use of federal monies to force states to adopt Common Core. And finally, what aspects of Common Core, if any, should parents be concerned about? Attorney Jane Robbins of the American Principles Project and Attorney Will Estrada from the Homeschool Legal Defense Association will help us address that question. And as always, this FRC program is designed to not only be informative, but it's designed to help you take action. So grab a tablet, something to write with, so that you can take notes, because class is in session. Also, we'll be taking your questions. If you'd like to ask me a question, uh, just raise your hand. No, not really. Uh, just email us at uh, commoncore at frc.org. That's commoncore at frc.org. Or if you're into tweeting, you can tweet us. Tweet to FRCDC, hashtag CC questions. All right, to assist me in this special program, I've asked FRC's resident expert on Common Core, Sarah Perry, a senior fellow here at FRC, to join me. Sarah, welcome. Thank you. Well, I'll have to tell you, Sarah, in school, history was one of my favorite topics. So let's say we start with the history of Common Core. Okay, let's get to it. In 2009, the Race to the Top program was introduced to America, and with it, a $4.3 billion pot of federal money that was promised to states who signed on to its attendant standards, those now known as the Common Core. But what exactly is Common Core? The Common Core is a set of educational standards and assessments in math and English language arts and literacy. ELA standards include literacy standards in history, social sciences, technical subjects as well, and these are standards and assessments for K-12 through students. The Common Core was a joint venture between two non-governmental agencies, the Council of Chief School State Officers and the National Governors Association, who jointly own the copyright to the Common Core, a copyright that prevents the modification or substitution of its content. It must be noted that the CCSSO and the NGA are both private trade organizations with no legislative authority. Common Core was majority funded by other private entities, including the Gates Foundation, who invested over $200 million, and who continues to advance the PR machine behind the Common Core with large sums of money. This educational reform package was presented and incentivized to the states at the height of a failing economy via Race to the Top, which included billions in grants and No Child Left Behind waivers. In addition, states had to join either the Partnership for Assessment of Readiness for College and Careers, also known as PARC, or the Smarter Balanced Assessment Consortium, the SBAC, in order to receive grants. So in order to get grants, states had to commit to all of this, standards and assessments, by January 19, 2010, before the standards were completed on June 2, 2010, the date on which the second and final draft was released. It was promised as a means to academic excellence and a buoyed international standing. It's proven to be a bureaucratic nightmare that involves substandard academics, a stunning increase in student data collection, a loss of local educational control, and the trampling of parental rights in the classroom. Our program tonight begins with a discussion of the role of government in education and what the current administration had to overcome in order to push the Common Core initiative through to the state level. You know, Sarah, it's not like we don't have a, a history here of what happens when the federal government gets involved in education. In fact, that's what our first speaker addressed recently. I want you to take a look 
at this video clip. If you look at their scores over the last roughly 40 years, so basically the entire time that the federal government has been involved in elementary and secondary education, if you look at those scores, they are almost completely flat. No improvement whatsoever. This despite a roughly 300 percent real increase, inflation-adjusted increase, in federal per pupil spending. I don't think you can get a more compelling set of data than that to show that federal education policy has failed. Dr. Neil McCluskey is the Associate Director for the Center for Educational Freedom at Cato Institute and also happens to be the author of Feds in the Classroom, How Big Government Corrupts, Cripples, and Compromises American Education. Welcome to the show. Thanks. Thanks Neil, welcome. Uh, well, that's a title right there in the book. Yes, that, it is. Uh, it, it tell the whole story. Well, let's tar start with this. The, the laws are pretty clear about the federal government being involved in curriculum and education. How does the Obama administration get away with what they're doing? Well, in, in a large sense, they get away with it because we haven't enforced the Constitution in several decades. None of this is authorized in the Constitution. What they then have to deal with is several federal education laws, the uh, Department of Education Creation Act, uh, the ESEA, Elementary and Secondary Education Act, and they all have provisions that say the federal government can't control your curriculum, your program of instruction, or essentially what you teach in the classroom. So what they've done is parse words, basically. They've insisted that the Common Core doesn't do anything with your curriculum. It's just standards. And they say it tells you what you need to be able to do not how to do it. The reality is if you look at the Common Core, it becomes very specific, especially in math, about how you do lots of things. Hmm. Now, for those people out there who are going to address the issue of curriculum versus standards, let's go to that 15% that local boards of education and teachers are allowed to include because we know that these are copyrighted and that the copyright is owned by these two non-governmental agencies. Is that 15 percent enough to localize control of education? No, not only is it enough, but it's very important to understand that you have to take the Common Core in its entirety. So it's not like you could say I'm going to remove 15 percent right. that I don't like. That 15 percent for one thing is just an add-on. So you take off Common Core and then if you have time and there are other things you'd like to include, then maybe you can add it. That's not nearly enough time. And more importantly, you will be held accountable for how you do on Common Core aligned tests, not on tests that are your local tests. So all the pressure will be on learning the Common Core, and there'll be no real pressure on how you do on that other 15%. Now, to defend the Obama administration, not that I'm very good at that, but uh, let's say when you look at the history of this, this actually did start as an idea at the state level, but it appears to have been hijacked then by the federal government, which is now driving this train. Yeah, and we have to actually be very clear about that. We have to remember this is put into more than 20 years of federal education policy. So it's really in the late 1980s, actually, that the federal government started to say, look, if you want this Elementary and Secondary Education Act money, you have to start showing us that you are having some sort of discernible outcomes. 1994, they reauthorized it, and it's called the Improving America's School Act. It says states, now you have to have standards, now you have to have tests, and you will be held accountable for performance on those things. So this has actually been put into decades of federal right policy. So even when core supporters say, well, look, the NGA and the CCSSO gathered people voluntarily to put this together, they were doing it already required by the federal government. So it's been, this has been a long time in coming, and it's really kind of reached the zenith right here with the Common right. Core. And people need to understand that's the trajectory of federal policy, and it has been for well over two decades more and more toward federal dictation of exactly what your kids will learn. We're not there exactly with Common right. Core, but we're this close. But as you've pointed out, the, uh, the results of that, the fruit from this has been extremely disappointing when you look at the, the money that's been placed into the classroom, or into he, education, I should say. Yes, yeah, I mean, if you look at education-wide, the spending is, is it's like the space shuttle taking off, and the results are Death Valley. They're completely flat. Same if you compare to federal spending. And the reality is the research on standards-driven uh, um, education is that it doesn't seem to have much positive outcome or in, impact 
on what's actually learned and we've seen that at the state level and we've especially seen that in no child left behind so we know that this sort of centralization or at least we have very good reason to believe it really doesn't work yet we're trying it we're just saying let's do it a little harder what do you think is the philosophical bias behind a program like common core considering that this is a convergence of corporate interests, so you have people like Gates and Exxon Mobil and the Chamber of Commerce pushing very strong for this initiative, but you also have big government involved. So what do you think is the impetus behind a program like this? Well, I, I mean, I think a lot of people have different reasons for it, but I think the real driver and the money behind it, especially when you talk about Bill Gates or, or other businessmen, is I think they're well-intentioned and they think we have got to produce better, more efficient, more effective workers. They, it appears, haven't really studied the impact of this sort of top-down control, but they tend to look at the whole education system like it's a firm, like it's a company, mm -hmm. and they've been doing this for decades, and saying, if I were in charge, I'd set one standard, I'd force everybody to meet it. They don't realize that's not how it works in a politicized public education system. But that's really the main driver, is they want to have more efficient, effective workers, which of course is a big problem if you think education is about a lot more than just producing the next uh, you know, factory worker. Absolutely, and there's a lot of discussion in the standards about improving global performance and the global economy, and what it makes it sound like is that you are creating human capital, not human beings. Yeah, absolutely, and if you read what lots of the Chamber of Commerce puts out, lots of other business groups, the Business Roundtable, and they've been putting this out for several years now, trying to defend the core. Repeatedly, it's about we have to prepare workers for the, for the world economy. And there seems to be almost no consideration whatsoever of building good, well-rounded human beings, like you said. Neil, uh, Cato has done a lot of work on this issue. Where can folks find out more about the research that you've done on this? Sure, you can go to <coughs> www.cato.org, C-A-T-O.org. You can find education under our issues. You can look up my name, and you'll f or you can just search on our website, Common Core, and you'll get more than you could ever possibly want to read. And the name of your book again? Uh, it's Feds in the Classroom. I won't give you the whole subtitle because it's so inflammatory. I'm going to make you write that 100 <laughs> times on the chalkboard before you leave. <laughs> Neil, thanks so much for being with us. I appreciate the insight and the work that uh, Cato has done on this. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. Right. Great. Yeah. Well, folks, uh, the president himself has uh, spoken to this issue and shown how he wants to use your dollars to coerce states into getting into line. Watch this. Now, one of the benchmarks we will use is whether states are designing and enforcing higher and clear standards and assessments that prepare a student to graduate from college and succeed in life. Right now, some states like Mass Massachusetts are setting high standards, but many others are not. Many others are low-balling expectations for students, telling our kids they're prepared to move on to the next grade even if they aren't, awarding diplomas even if a graduate doesn't have the knowledge and skills to thrive in our economy. That's a recipe for economic decline, and it has to stop. With the Race to the Top Fund, we will reward states that come together and adopt a common set of standards and assessments. Now, let me be clear. This is not about the kind of testing that is mushroomed under No Child Left Behind. This is not about more tests. It's not about teaching to the test. And it's not about judging a teacher solely on the results of a single test. It is about finally getting testing right, about developing thoughtful assessments that lead to better results, assessments that don't simply measure whether, whether students can use a pencil to fill in a bubble, but whether they possess basic knowledge and essential skills like problem solving and creative thinking, creativity and entrepreneurship, and already, 46 states are working to develop such standards. I urge those 46 states to finish the job. I urge the other four to get on board. <laughs> well, joining us in studio tonight is a, another good friend of FRC, Congressman Tom Cotton of the 4th Congressional District of Arkansas. He is uh, one of our True Blue recipients, voting 100% with the uh, pro-family uh, pro-faith agenda. Congressman, uh, welcome tonight. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, sir. Well, let's jump right into this. The president's talking about uh, essentially using federal money uh, to force states to comply with his agenda. I mean, is this not a, a federal uh, curriculum that's being forced on the states? I believe it is, Tony. And that's the parents from whom I hear the, the main objection they have. 
So they have some quibbles with the actual Common Core standards that were developed by governors and chief school officers, private organizations. That's something they probably could have worked out on their own or worked it out on a state-by-state -state basis to adjust for the needs of children in each state or each uh, municipality. But when the federal government said, we're going to condition billions of dollars of federal money on your acceptance of the Common Core, before you even know what the standards are, then that really oversteps the federal government's bounds. In fact, it, it is an affront to federal laws that said there will not be a federal curriculum. What's currently the movement in Congress? Well, right now, uh, there is a resol resolution under consideration. Jeff Duncan from South Carolina has proposed mm -hmm. it. He goes through the history of what happened, the Common Core, and how it was kind of hijacked by the federal government and the Department of Education to express the sense of the Congress that we should not have federal standards, that states and especially local schools, school boards, parents, and teachers should be making these decisions. Ultimately, though, I think we may have to take legislative action to stop the federal government from doing so. One reason I decided to run for the Senate is it's important that we have a conservative Senate that can work with the conservative House and put the brakes on some of these regulatory overreaches. One way we can do that, for instance, is simply by denying any funding for the Department of Education to implement Common Core standards, and that would effectively return the decisions back to the states. Now, Congressman Cotton, I mean, I, I know you have been uh, all across the state of Arkansas here recently uh, visiting with a lot of folks. Is this an issue that you're hearing about? Yes. You know, the, this has been an issue that's percolating uh, in some circles for a few years now, but it's only now becoming uh, a fact in people's lives. And, you know, there's lots of issues, whether it's Obamacare or taxes, that affect you in very direct ways. But it's hard to think of many ways more that's more direct effect than what your kids are bringing home at night and the homework you see. And when you have educated moms and dads, you know, who did perfectly well in school that can't help their three year old or their third grader do their own mm -hmm. math problems, you got a problem with these curriculum standards. And that's just why we don't need Washington bureaucrats making these decisions. We need local schools, we need local uh, school boards and parents making it. Another concern I hear is people who send their kids to private schools, especially religious schools, or who homeschool are worried that the next step is imposing those standards on them as a way to make decisions about who gets certain workplace uh, training or, uh, opportunities or who gets into colleges. And that's a big concern of mine as well. And we know from the research that's been done and from all of the facts that we've done extensive reading on that now particularly that David Coleman is president of the College Board, uh -huh. the authoritative source on the SAT and now on the AP U.S. History uh, program, yeah. that the students who want to take the SAT to apply for certain colleges are going to have to take a core aligned SAT, the same thing with the GED. So it's yeah. really affecting children in all sorts of education. And I do, you know, and, and parents are the ones that make, should, should make decisions for their kids. Like in my small hometown in Dardanelle, my mom was a teacher for 40 years and I went mm -hmm. to our public school. There weren't a lot of options there. But whether you want to send your child to a public school, a religious school, a private secular school, homeschool them, that should be the choice for you to make. And especially if you're choosing to send your child to a private school or homeschool them, you should also be making choices based on the curriculum. You shouldn't have organizations like the College Board or the Department of Education imposing those standards on you in the way you're trying to raise your child in your own home. Now, so, finally, I want to ask you a final question about H.R. 5, the Student Success Act, and the prospects of mm -hmm. that. What, what do parents need to do to help get that through? Very simple. Call your congressman, call your senator, especially call your Democratic senators, because mm -hmm. we passed the Student Success Act, which would reform a lot of these federal programs and empower states and especially local communities and parents to make the decisions that are best for them over a year ago now. It's been stalled in the Senate. We have a short amount of time left in this Congress, right. but that doesn't mean that if they hear from the people who hired them, the voters to whom they answer, that those senators might not take it up. And Hopefully we can pass it and begin to get some reforms that we need so badly. All right, Congressman Tom Cotton, thanks so much for being with Thank us. Thank you. Appreciate uh, you being a 100 percenter with us. Sarah. Pleasure. Well, Sarah, this actually be a good time to put up those action steps on, yes. on the screen. If we've got those action steps, uh, since Congressman Cotton prompted us, uh, this is what these are the, what you need to do. These are the action steps you need to take. You need to write your state legislators and your members of Congress and let them know where you stand on this issue. You have to attend local school board and state board of education meetings. In fact, we're going to be showing some video of something that went very awry at one of these meetings, but it was because someone voiced a concern, and that's what you need to do. These opportunities exist for you to voice. And by the way, still to come on the program tonight, uh, 
Governor of Louisiana, my home state, Bobby Jindal, will be joining us to tell his view of Common Core, why he reversed himself, originally a supporter of Common Core, now very vocal in his opposition to Common Core. So we have now um, a piece that we'd like you to take a look at. One of our next experts is Dr. Sandra Stotsky, and uh, she is from the University of Arkansas. She has a very extensive history, and I'll introduce her some more. But she's voiced some very strong concerns and actually served on the Common Core Validation Committee. But take a look at some of the things she had to say about Common Core. We were expected to say, apparently, that these standards were internationally benchmarked. They followed procedures that were appropriate, a few other things and I couldn't do that. Then about two weeks later I discovered there was a report on the validation committee on the website for Common Core. It simply listed the members who were on the committee and then it listed the names of people who signed on. But when I counted up the number of names we were missing five so that's when I figured out who, that there were five people who had not signed on. Five out of 30 is a very large number considering the fact that that we were under enormous political pressure to actually sign on. So that was from uh, Building the Machine, a wonderful documentary that the Homeschool Legal Defense Association put together. You can find it at CommonCoreMovie.com. We actually have a representative from HSLDA here in studio with us tonight. and. Um, wonderfully executed piece and I encourage everyone to visit it because we hear actually from another validation committee member who also refused to sign on but right now we're going to talk with Dr. Sandra Stotsky. She is one of the most qualified women in education you will ever meet. She is Professor Emerita at the University of Arkansas, former Associate Commissioner of the State Board of Education in Massachusetts and credited with nearly single-handedly putting together the English language arts curriculum that was the highest in the nation. But perhaps most germane to our discussion, she was on the validation committee. She was approached by the drafters, sat in a closed door validation committee meeting, and refused to sign on. And we're going to talk to her about why. So, Dr. Stotsky, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for inviting me. Well, let's start with this question. Uh, explain your role in the, uh, the, with the Common Core Standards. I was on the validation committee for one year, 09 to 10, and I followed all of its activities as best I could, and I spoke to the standards writers in English language arts because that's my area of expertise. And how were you approached? Do you remember specifically why they came to you? Now, we understand that you have a great deal of expertise, but I'm curious as to what the composition was of the people who were on the validation committee. I was the only English language arts standards expert and I was recommended for the committee very strongly by Mitchell Chester who was the Commissioner of Education in Massachusetts and knew what I had done when I had been in the department. I had retired from the department in 03 and I was serving on the state board from 06 on. He recommended me for the validation committee and after much shuffling of feet, I think, they finally put me on at the very last minute. I'm sure they have rued the day ever since. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I can't think of anything more frightening than an English teacher. I can remember them scaring me back when I was in school. But, uh, Dr. Satsi, let me ask you this question. What are your greatest concerns as you saw this unfold as it pertains to the standards? My greatest concerns are that these are the wrong standards in both English and in math. And when your viewers can look at the two outlines that I prepared, they would see, and I've written about this voluminously anyway, all the major flaws that are in the English language arts standards. And Professor Milgram, who was the only mathematician on the validation committee, has prepared an outline of all of the missing or delayed math standards. So it's one thing to want to equalize expectations across the country. Within each state, that's what standards were for. But when the federal government imposes the wrong standards, then we have a serious issue because 
half the states are trying to get out of the sticky jar of molasses they were put into. Well, I, I want to clarify something here. I mean, you, you were the single uh, expert as it pertains to the English standards, and then you just made reference to the math standards. The two experts on standards for those topics were opposed to what they came up with, and they were the only voices, the expert voices on the committee. How, how in the world did they put these standards together without the experts? That is an excellent question. They had standards writers who were chosen by probably the Gates Foundation and Achieve Incorporated. We really don't know because the different organizations that came together to create the project and to run the project were private, all of them. So there are no public records at all. We do not know why, for example, David Coleman, whom you mentioned before, was chosen to be the chief writer for English language arts. He had no background experience with it, never taught, and is now in charge of the college boards without any sophistication in measurement or the advanced skills one would expect someone who is in charge of college boards to have. So we don't know why the people were chosen, but the validation committee was not particularly encouraged, I'm putting that charitably, they were not encouraged to work with the writers. Whatever we did, we were simply to share with each other, and that was it. So let me for a moment go back to these slides that we've shown. And I had to work very hard, uh, Dr. Stotsky, as you know, to summarize some of these because these are major deficits. They are pages, single-spaced paragraph deficits that are missing from better written standards. So just some of the few that we pulled out. No standard on history of English language. No history on authors of the ancient world. And you have mentioned in previous discussions I've listened to, for example, the Iliad or the Odyssey, which were sure. standards when I grew up and I remember reading them Class with great interest. The classics. The classical writers or texts from ancient times, there was nothing in a standard to suggest they should be continued to be taught. There was no standard on British literature. Only Shakespeare was mentioned as if there was nothing before Shakespeare or after Shakespeare. Hmm. Now, there are some words in an end note, a sidebar or a footnote, that urge teachers to make sure they include all of what we know an educated student should study, but it's not in the standards, which are for the most part simply skills, content-free and culture-free skills. They are the wrong standards. In math, the situation is possibly even worse. So math is very... Many missing standards in math, particularly in the higher grades. So where, ma I'm sorry, I, I, where it makes it impossible for students to actually go from a weak Algebra two course, according to Professor Milgram, to a, an advanced math or science course as a freshman that would let them be able to consider a STEM major in four years. So some of the things we've talked about, and again, these were pages, Dr. Stotsky, that we've pulled, and I've also heard from James Milgram, but they are standard algorithms for multiplication and division, no prime factorization, missing full trigonometry, pre-calc and calculus, delays completion of Algebra one. These are massive, massive weaknesses. In fact, we were told, as you know, Jason Zimba, we've heard him testify that these will not prepare students for STEM careers and will That's only right. prepare them for non-selective two-year colleges. Right, and that is why I am still puzzled as to why the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, ExxonMobil, and all of our major companies, for some reason, seem to think that these standards are a silver bullet when they are weaker than what many students have been already experiencing. And some of these higher level math and science courses in high school are already disappearing according to parents in California and other places where they're watching anxiously to see what is going to happen to the upper level courses in grade 11 grade or grade 12 when you don't have the math to support these advanced courses. So the, whoever spoke before and said 
that we would want all states to adopt these standards. All states need to find ways to get out of these standards so that we can begin the long road back to sanity in our K-12 curriculum. Well, final question for you, Dr. Stotsky. How can states begin that process of crafting better standards for their students in their states as it should be? There are right now two not different models that I would talk about. One is what Ohio is now trying to do. Andy Thompson is the state rep who is behind the bill that I testified on a few weeks ago. Oklahoma is trying a different model. What was done in Indiana under Governor Pence is totally the wrong model because it was an act of deception. And I want to just get back to the two good models that we have. Ohio is asking to get rid of Common Core and in a two-year interim use the old pre-2009 standards from Massachusetts in all four major subjects for the interim while it develops its own good first-rate Ohio standards. Oklahoma has just had a bill signed by Governor Mary Fallon a couple of months ago and they want to have their own good standards developed, but in the interim, they want to go back to their old standards. So that seems to be the two differences. Some states can go back to their old standards if they were happy with them, and some states may want to use the old pre-2009 Massachusetts standards as an interim. Now, I have heard from some people who are very unhappy about what they claim will be throwing away four years of trying to implement Common Core. And what I can tell them based on my experience in Massachusetts is that it will be cheaper and easier not to continue implementing Common Core, which is going to be professional development forever for teachers because these are the wrong standards and they're being taught the wrong strategies to use. But they could be much happier if they, these teachers at the secondary level if they had standards that you could just basically fall into, which is what happened in Massachusetts. Teachers were able to teach to them in high school in all subjects because they were designed to reflect the teacher's disciplinary background. And that is what Ohio may benefit from it, if it can pass this particular bill. Dr. Stotsky, thank you so much. As always, it is wonderful to hear the insight of somebody who has spent a career educating and reforming for the better. It's been a privilege to talk to you tonight. Thank you for inviting me. Fascinating conversation, uh, Sarah, with Dr. Stotsky, and a great setup for our next interview. Earlier today, uh, I had an opportunity to catch up with uh, Governor Jindal, governor of my home state of Louisiana. Uh, he was on the road uh, in the neighboring state of, uh, of Texas, but uh, as I set the stage for this interview, remember that uh, Governor Jindal was an early supporter of Common Core because right. of the higher standards, which is something we hear a lot sure. about. And I've known Governor Jindal since I was in office and he was the Secretary of Health and Hospitals in Louisiana. Uh, he himself uh, is very uh, interested in improving education in Louisiana, so it's fascinating to see his change on this issue. And I talked with him about that earlier today. Uh, let's listen to that interview. Great. Uh, Governor Jindal, obviously education very important to you. A graduate of Brown University, a master's degree uh, from uh, Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar. Uh, you initially were supportive of Common Core, but then after information came to light, you changed your position. Why? Tony, you're exactly right. Look, originally this was sold, Common Core was sold as a state-led, bottom-up approach to putting higher standards in our classrooms. I'm all for rigorous standards. I'm all for making sure our kids learn the very best so they can compete with other kids in other states and other countries and do well in this modern economy. We've done a lot of things in Louisiana, from letting the dollars follow the child to tenure reform to charter schools and choice to making that a reality. Here are my two fundamental concerns with Common Core. Number one, even though they said it was going to be a bottom-up approach, this has really turned into an attempt by the federal government to make curriculum decisions that they've got no right making. This, these are decisions that have always been made at the local level, and fundamentally, when it comes to education, I trust parents to be the first and best educators. No two children learn exactly alike. Some kids will do better in home schools, 
public schools, charter schools, online schools, parochial schools, Christian schools, independent schools, whatever. The point is, let's let parents make the best decisions for their kids because every child learns differently. Instead, Common Core has become a way for the federal government to force states into allowing them to make curriculum decisions. You see that with the race of the top money. You see that with the no child left behind waivers. You see that with the federal, the huge federal grants to park and, and smart balance. That's why we've gone to federal court to say this violates the Tenth Amendment to the Constitution, the proper state and local government role, and it also violates federal law saying they should be in control of education. The second concern I've got is not just as a governor, but as a father, and I encourage any parent that's undecided about Common Core to go look at the materials. And I sat down last year, my little uh, boy was in second grade last year, and he brought home some Common Core math sets. Tony, they made absolutely no sense. I mean, he was getting the right answers on his own, but the way that they were trying to have to teach Common Core uh, math, this new, new math is what I call it, made no intuitive sense. And we've seen a lot of parents worried about the reading texts associated with Common Core. And the reality is, the reality is these are decisions that should be made at the local level. They should have allowed teachers and parents more input, more transparency. They didn't do that. We shouldn't let the federal government take over our classrooms. To me, that's what Common Core represents. So you have the curriculum that is obviously of concern, but as a parent, you've seen it yourself uh, in your own children bringing home their work from school. But what role did other parents within the state of Louisiana, our home state, what role did that play in causing you to rethink your support for Common Core? Tony, look, I've said all along, we've got to listen to the parents. It played a huge role to see the growing numbers of just sincere moms and dads come to the Capitol, come to meet with us, getting frustrated. They weren't getting information about the use of standards, about the test, about the curriculum. Not only parents, but teachers. And you're seeing this nationally. Even though the unions have continued to endorse Common Core, we see in Louisiana, uh, the unions themselves did a survey showing the majority of teachers said they weren't ready for Common Core. You're seeing across the country more and more parents and teachers coming out. In Louisiana, you should hear the heartfelt pleas from these moms, and it's especially moms saying that it just, they're frustrating, the, the Common Core is frustrating their kids. They can't get information about it. In our state, they, I believe they went around the bidding requirements to, to go and select a favored contractor. I just think you know, one of the things we keep saying to the proponents is if you really believe in the slow down, why are mm-hmm. they afraid of transparency? Why are they afraid of working with the parents? It's dangerous to me when elite bureaucrats think they know better than parents. And that's the same attitude we saw when we tried to do school choice, same attitude we're now facing with Common Core. Why in the world are they afraid of listening to the parents? Again, I believe parents are the first and best educators. But, Tony, I think this is part of a bigger pattern. You know, the left, they don't trust parents to choose schools or education for their kids. They don't trust us to buy big gulps. They don't trust us to buy our own health insurance, to decide what kind of health insurance we want. They don't trust us with our Second Amendment rights. They don't trust us with our religious liberty rights. I think there's a pattern here. The left thinks they know how to live our lives better than we do. They think that they need to be paternalistic. The government needs to intervene. To me, this is just another example of that. Uh, Governor, I want to thank you for joining us for this uh, special uh, broadcast on Common Core. And I want to ask, ask you one final question as we part. Do you see other states taking the same route that Louisiana has had, where at once a part of this, but after taking a closer look, rejecting it and moving in another direction? Absolutely, Tony. First of all, thank you for taking the time to shed light on this very important topic. You've been a great national voice on many, many issues, and I appreciate you taking the time to shine the light on Common Core for your listeners, for your uh, followers, absolutely. You look at what's happening across the country. For example, Oklahoma got out of Common Core, and as a result, Arne Duncan and, and the federal education first threatened them, and now have taken away some flexibility from them. You see state after state. You see in the Carolinas. Uh, you, you see more and more states moving away from Common Core, and I think you're going to see this trend only grow. The more that this becomes practical and reality, not just theoretical, the more the parents and teachers see this, the less they like it, One final comment I'd say, a lot of times the supporters of Common Core try to say, well, if you're against Common Core, you're against standards. That's nonsense. I'm for rigor. I'm for standards. I'm for our kids learning and and, and thinking for themselves and having the best skills. That doesn't mean you have to be for Common Core. You can be against the federal takeover of our curriculum and still be for standards. I think my prediction is you're going to see more and more states joining the effort to get out of Common Core. I hope we're successful in our federal lawsuit. I hope the Tenth Amendment to the Constitution still means something. We have never allowed the federal government to make curriculum decisions. Let's not start today. Governor General, thanks so much for being with us. Thanks, Tony.
Sarah, another excellent reminder why parents can make a difference when they weigh in. And speaking of weighing in, uh, some of your questions are coming in. And again, uh, you can email us if you'd like to uh, email us a question. Email us at commoncore at frc.org, or you can tweet us, uh, frcdc, hashtag CC questions. And a question coming in from Faith. Could you explain more regarding the data collection process for students as well as the constitutional legality of such collecting? That's a great question. It actually sets up something I'd like to show you before we have our next guest come in. Take a look at this video and watch how some parents in upstate New York responded when they realized data was being collected about their children. With the scan of one fingerprint, data can be collected from students and this is the biggest concern for parents. This is already being seen in schools like Cuba Rushford School in Cuba, New York. This is a permission slip from the school so students can get lunches using a finger touchpad rather than ID. The school says this isn't fingerprinting, but parents tonight are concerned about data mining. They think it's a little too 1984. Parents don't realize, I did not realize until tonight, that when I report to my school district, the school district has access to private information about my children. That I don't, frankly, I don't want them to have. It's a little frightening, isn't it? Well, our next guest is Jane Robbins, who is a senior fellow and attorney who practices with the American Principles Project. She has written and spoken extensively on the concept of data mining, among other things, and she joins us tonight by Skype. Welcome, Jane. It's good to have you. Thank you. It's good to be here. So, Jane, before we begin, I have something to read to you, and I just want to get your reaction. This is from the National Common Core's official governmental website. Implementing the Common Core state standards does not require data collection. The means of assessing students and the use of the data that result from those assessments are up to the discretion of the state and are separate and unique from Common Core. So what's your response to that? Well, the standards themselves don't require data collection, that's true, but Common Core is part of a much broader scheme. Common Core was part of the whole Race to the Top initiative, which required states not only to adopt these standards, but to adopt assessments that go along with the standards and to build out their state data systems. So that's what the states were required to do, and that's what almost all of them agreed to do. So um, the, the data collection comes in most directly through the assessments, because there are two consortia that are being funded illegally by the federal government to create these assessments that align with Common Core. And those um, consortia both have cooperative agreements with the U.S. Department of Education, which allows the U.S. Department to see any data that is collected on any child who takes one of the tests. So if you're in a state that, that is still in one of these consortia, and there are a lot of states dropping out wisely, but if you're in one that hasn't done that yet, any information about your child that is collected through the assessment system will be made available to the federal government. Uh, Jane, let's talk uh, uh, about the type of information that's being collected on our children and what the federal government is gleaning from that. Well, the federal government wants essentially everything. Arnie Duncan has said that, that he wants to be able to track Johnny from when he's in preschool through when he's in the workforce and to know everything that Johnny does. Uh, for all of those years. And to do that, you've got to collect data. Um, it's the, the progressive idea of education and, and societal control run amok. And now they have the technology to do that. So that's what the federal government is, is encouraging. There is something called the National Education Data Model, which is part of the U.S. Department of Education. And it recommends, it doesn't require, but it recommends over 400 data points to be collected on each child. And that would include things such as um, disciplinary history, uh, health history, things like that, uh, family income. It just goes on and on. And different states are at different points on the road of, of going where the federal government wants them to go. But they're all being incentivized to do this through, the, um, through money, of course. That's the way the federal government gets the, the states to fall into line. They offer to give them money, and they did during the, um, the uh, stimulus bill. That's where all of this money came from, to get the states to build out their student data systems. And they're being asked to build them all or required to build them all um, identically because there's a federal statute that prohibits the federal government from maintaining a national student database. But if it gets all the states to build identical databases, then they can all be shared. And 
you have a national student database de facto. So, well, let me let me follow up with Jan on that because I think yes. this is important for parents to understand that once this information enters into the federal realm, how long does it last? Where can it go? What can it be used for? It would be eternal. Um, there is a statute that was passed in 1974 that's called FERPA, the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act, which puts limits on the sharing of personally identifiable student data. However, two years ago, two and a half now, the Obama administration gutted FERPA by regulation, not by statute. And um, now under FERPA, a, the federal government or a state government or a school could share personally identifiable student data with literally anyone in the world as long as they use the right language to justify the sharing. And the parents would not have to consent to it. The parents would never know that it's happening. So if the assessments are the problem, Jane, we've talked about the difference between Common Core really not requiring data collection, but in a version of semantics, the website represents it's not, it's not the standards, but it's the assessments that we now learn. What if we drop the tests and the assessments? Would that save the privacy of this increased data collection? No, it really doesn't. It would help. Um, it's, from a data privacy standpoint, it's better not to be in one of these consortia than to be in one. However, the federal government has many, many initiatives going on to try to incentivize the states to collect more data and to build more identical systems and to work on sharing data. There are, are a multitude of federal initiatives that are designed to do that because they really believe, they are the progressive um, people who want to control everything, especially the economy. You have to remember that Common Core is not a, an education model, it's a workforce development model. And they think they need to know everything about every child and that everything should be able to be shared, especially with departments of labor, health and human services, that sort of thing. So the goal is, and they're moving toward it step by step, is to have this data out there that can be shared just all over the place. Jane, one final question tonight, because I, I, I'm sure this has gotten the attention of a lot of parents who may have just uh, had Common Core appear on their radar screen, but not sure what it means. But now you're talking about this data collection, all this different information that's going to be out there about their children. First, is there any way around this to, to end this data collection? And, and secondly, what can parents do right now, right here and now? Well, parents um, can lean on their federal legislators and their state legislators. Uh, there is a movement afoot across the country, actually, in many different states to pass stronger privacy legislation on the state level to try to fill in the gaps that now exist in FERPA. And there's also a movement on, in Congress to, to shore up FERPA. FERPA hasn't been revised in, in decades, so it really needs to be revised. Um, but parents also need to, to be aware of other sorts of data collection, the things that come in with the digital learning and the devices and the measuring of the so-called fine-grained data on students. They need to be aware of that too and not agree to let their, their children be involved in the digital learning platforms unless they understand what those platforms can do, what sorts of data they collect, physiological data they collect on children, because that is the really scary part of this. Jane, your expertise is, as always, invaluable. If people want more information, can they go to AmericanPrinciplesProject.org? Yes. Excellent. Thank you so much for joining us, and uh, I'm sure you'll be seeing increased traffic in the next few days. Thanks so much, Jane. Thanks, Sarah. I tell you, Sarah, if that doesn't motivate parents to get involved, I don't know what will. 400 data points, information collected on uh, little Johnny and little yep. Susie as they uh, cross through the, uh, the schoolroom door. Anyway, let's uh, do this before we uh, transition to our last segment. Uh, let's once again put those action steps up on the screen so folks will know exactly what they need to do. And, you know, do your homework. We're helping you here. I'm a, I'm a little tutor here helping you tonight. Do your homework. Visit frc.org uh, and you can also look at corestandards.org and other partner organization websites that we've mentioned tonight. Please educate and assemble with each other. Share your stories. So much of this is anecdotal experiences of parents who are experiencing this firsthand. They have stories to share. They have information to share with one another. So make sure that you assemble and spread the word. And, and I am seeing this across the country. 
folks are starting to catch on to what's going on here as they Big Brother are. is uh, elbowing their way into the classroom. All right, a number of questions coming in tonight, which uh, really uh, helps set up our, uh, our last segment. A number of questions dealing with the rights of parents. Bailey says, do parents have the right to opt out of Common Core's controversial teaching? Uh, Jessica says, what happens to homeschool parents that mm. refuse to teach Common Core curriculum? Uh, what exactly are some of the most alarming aspects of Common Core curriculum from a Christian standpoint? And of course the list goes on of questions similar to this. So uh, I think we should invite our next guest to, uh, to join us who can help answer all these questions. I would agree. Um, Will Estrada is Director of Federal Relations at the Homeschool Legal Defense Association and uh, he joins us today to talk about grassroots and protecting children in all educational environments. Welcome, Will. Great to be on, Sarah. Tony, thank you. Well, Will, let me jump right into this. Thanks for being with us. Um, parents who have children in private schools, parents who have children that they homeschool, is this an issue that they should be concerned about or is Common Core something they don't have to worry about? Tony, it absolutely is an issue that every single parent and particularly homeschool parents need to be concerned about. Two years ago, I was at the Institute for Educational Leadership. I was asked, uh, along with Lindsey Burke from the Heritage Foundation, to talk about uh, some of the issues concerning just school choice. I thought it would be kind of a non-controversial issue. I began to speak, and immediately these public school teachers, administrators, and other officials who were at that conference, they interrupted us. They basically shouted us down because they said, you cannot trust parents to be able to be involved in the education of oh. their children. It was shocking and unfortunately it was very sad and it illustrates this whole battle with the Common Core. That it's a simple question, who is responsible right. for the education and upbringing of kids? And the folks behind the Common Core are saying it's the government and we say it's parents. Speaking of illustrations, I think it would be a great uh, opportunity to show one of the video clips we have from Maryland, uh, not far from here. Uh, where a parent simply showed up to ask questions at a, a school board meeting. I, and I want to get your response to this, Will, when we show it. Uh, let's watch this. Don't stand for this. Try, you're sitting here like cattle. You have questions. You yeah. confront them. Sure. They don't yeah. want to do it in public. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, Will, I have to ask you, is, is, is this an anomaly or is this something we're seeing more and more as the, 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 the structure becomes defensive and wants to shut parents out? It's not an anomaly. And Tony, homeschoolers fought this battle. 30 years ago when Homeschool Legal Defense was founded in 1983, which was a great year for freedom, that was when FRC was founded, we were founded because of what happens when you have nationalization leading to standardization and just control over all the parents. Homeschooling was illegal in most of the 50 states. So homeschoolers know what happens when we cannot, when we are un unable to kind of stop this. And that's why it's so crucial that we fight this. We're seeing that video where a parent is basically frog marched out of the uh, meeting where he's talking about, where he's concerned about the education his kids are receiving and that's why this is so crucial to fight it in the public schools to fight in the private schools so that it does not one day come down and control homeschooling so it seems like the success of this movement really is going to come if anywhere from the parents themselves exactly. it really has to be taking back a parental authority and autonomy of the family and to be able to say these are the choices that we're making so it looks like from the bottom up is how we're going to win the fight so let's talk about what's happening at the state level that's working and and what successes have been you know it was two moms in indiana heather crossan and erin tuttle who actually showed us that we can win that we can roll back the uh, tide of the common core the indiana uh, legislature passed and governor pence signed the bill into law which started to take indiana out of the common core it's not a perfect situation we've heard from some of our uh, experts who've talked about how indiana has a lot of work to go and to do but it showed us that it can be done and since then uh, legislatures in Oklahoma, in South Carolina, in Louisiana, we heard from Governor Jindal, in North Carolina, in Missouri, have pushed back against the Common Core. This is a battle we can win, it's a battle that we must win, because it really goes back to that central mm -hmm. quest question. Who's responsible for the education and upbringing of children? 
parents or the government. And, and this is being driven, I would say, not by the politicians, but by the parents who are pushing the politicians to reverse course in many cases. Exactly. It's moms and dads, it's ordinary people who are listening to this, who are doing an extraordinary battle to fight for their children's education. It's inspiring, frankly, and it's why I think homeschoolers are so passionate in joining in with the folks in public schools and private schools to say, enough is enough. Let's stand up, let's take charge of our child's education because it's so crucial. The freedom of our country depends on it. So how do you respond to when Arnie Duncan says something like, oh, this is a battle fought by white suburban moms who are frustrated their kids aren't as smart as they thought they were? Sarah, I'm talking to parents. Uh, I'm a Latino myself, you know, from all backgrounds, from all schools, and they are saying, you know, I, it doesn't matter white, black, you know, whatever, am I Republican, Democrat, right. we're joining together to fight for their children's education. It's inspiring and it's incredible to see this. If we really are going to truly see reform in public schools, it's going to come from parents getting engaged, them following the model of homeschool parents who have sacrificed so much to educate their children and to raise them up in that individualized, you know, what's best for that child approach, not kind of outsourcing it to the big elites in education, but parents doing it themselves and teachers and local school boards getting involved as well. Well, Will, I, I want to just commend you for the work that you've done on Common Core, but Homeschool Legal Defense Association has done a yeoman's job when it comes to the educational issue, mm -hmm. in, in, specifically as I worked with them as a legislator on the issue of homeschooling mm -hmm. uh, for homeschool parents across the country. Because as you noted, it, it wasn't long ago when homeschooling was illegal. Uh, and a large part of the uh, freedoms that homeschoolers enjoy today is because of the work of Mike Ferris and you all did at Homeschool Legal Defense. But let me f finally ask this last question, because I want to be very clear about homeschoolers and private school uh, families. They're not beyond the reach of Common Core. Correct. The Common Core only right now officially applies to public schools. So if you are concerned about the Common Core, you have a great option. Of course, fight it in the public schools, but you can homeschool your kids. But the tentacles, this approach again of nationalizing and standardizing education, it's not going to be content to just apply to public schools. If we can't stop it from the nationalization, it's just a matter of time before homeschools are sucked in as well. We're seeing it even with the tests. We're concerned about the college alignment. It's a battle we've got to fight. It's a battle that affects every single parent in this country. So what do we do? What are some things that we can do? We've talked about action steps today. You know, three steps. Educate, outreach and then get involved in the political involved in the political arena when i say educate educate yourself and people who are listening to this webinar and who are visiting the frc uh, resources and the hslda resources that's what you're doing talk to your friends talk to your family members get involved and talk to the voters talk to the people in your church or house of worship then outreach Go to the schools, go to the unions, go to the PTA meetings, go to your homeschool support groups, get involved. We need a broad-based coalition, and it's actually exciting to see, you know, unions are coming out in, in opposition to some they of the aspects indeed. of the Common Core. They're saying, you know, teachers, my dad just retired from 30 years of public education, and the teachers are frustrated that they're losing that control with the education. But then get involved in action. We've seen from the moms, from the ordinary moms and dads who you know, are raising their kids, but who are also fighting this, that we can win. So write to your elected officials. Find out where your elected officials, what they stand, where their position is on the Common Core, and then get involved. It takes a lot of work, but I always remember what Edmund Burke said, that um, the only thing necessary for evil to triumph is for good men and good women to do nothing. And today we're seeing good parents, good people across this country fighting back, and by God's grace, I think winning. Well, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, one of the things that encourages me as I, I look out across the landscape is that when people are prompted to act as a result of, uh, of something they see is bad for the next generation, it gives you encouragement to know that people are, are still forward looking. Yeah. They still have hope for the future of their country. And, and we all know that you don't want anything to come between a mother and her child. <laughs> Uh, and that's really, in many cases, what I've seen leading this has been mothers, Sarah, that are yeah. out there making a difference. So if you're a mom out there and you're, you should be concerned about what your child is being taught, look at that material, go to those school board meetings, speak out, 
maybe you need to run for the school board to make a difference in terms of what's in the classroom in your local school. Absolutely. The more you can get involved, the more voices that we find in a unified way, the better this movement is going to work in our favor. So it's absolutely the parents that need to pull the bulk of the effort on this, but it's for the kids, it's for our children. What better sacrifice can be made? One more time, I wanna put those action steps up on the website so that you'll know exactly what you can do and make sure you're taking uh, copious notes here. We want you to write your state legislators, encourage them if they're in this stream of Common Core to reverse course and move on to their own standards. You can also contact your members of Congress so they'll make sure that the federal government is not using your tax dollars to force states into line. Attend local school board and state board of education meetings and we promise now that that video we showed has gone viral. It is highly unlikely you will be pulled out. <laughs> yeah, that's right. But get out there. These are open meetings for a reason. Unlike what happened in the validation committee, they are open to the public. Share your stories with other people. That's right. And do your homework. Visit FRC.org. There will be a test in the morning. <laughs> Will Estrada, thanks so much for being with us. And again, appreciate all the work that uh, Homeschool Legal Defense Association does. Thank you, Tony. We're glad to be working alongside of you. Thanks. And Sarah, thank you for co-hosting tonight. Thank you, Tony. It's been Pre a pleasure. Appreciate all the work that you're doing here at FRC uh, on behalf of families as it pertains to education. Thank you. And folks, thank you for being with us tonight. This is for you. We want you to be equipped with the information that you need to make a difference in the lives of your children and in your community. Thanks for tuning in and uh, may the Lord bless you.